Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 16. As we study the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, changing a city by changing one heart at a time. That's the theme of this second missionary journey. Paul is going to travel 3,000 miles across Asia. He's going to sail across the Aegean, and by foot, he's going to cover present-day Greece. He will begin in Macedonia up north and travel by foot all the way down to the end called Corinth. And why is he doing this? Because Jesus said, go into the highways and byways. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospels. Jesus said to the Pharisee named Nicodemus in the gospel of John chapter 3, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world that none would perish. Jesus did not come into the world that the world would be condemned. Jesus came into the world that the world might be saved. When Jesus ministered to the apostles and the disciples in Matthew chapter 10, we discover Jesus sending out the apostles right away, and he gave them power. He gave them an authority over sickness and disease and even the demonic spirits. He sent them out, the twelve. In Luke chapter 10, he has 72 disciples, and he does the same thing. He sends them out. Jesus is always sending us out. And Paul and Barnabas, and now Paul and Silas, and Timothy and Luke are responding to the call of God upon their lives. God says, I want you to go. An interesting study in the Gospels is how oftentimes... Jesus will say, I want you to go. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus said, the harvest is ripe unto harvest. It's white unto harvest. It is ready right now. The fields are white into harvest. It's interesting that each time Jesus ministers and he delivers somebody from a demonic spirit, maybe a sickness or disease. Many times in these stories found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus will say, like he said to the man he just delivered in Mark chapter 5, he said to the man, I want you to go home, and I want you to tell your family and your friends all that God has done. In the story found in Luke chapter 17, Jesus heals 10 lepers And he says to them, I want you to go and show yourself to others. The healing touch, the power from on high, the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ to heal you. In Acts chapter 1, at the very end of his ministry, just before he ascends to be with the Father, he says to the remaining disciples, you are going to receive power from the Holy Spirit And the Spirit will come upon you, and you will be empowered. You will be equipped to go and tell, to go and tell the world the gospel. You'll become my witnesses, Jesus said. You will go to Judea. You will go to Samaria, and you'll literally go to the ends of the earth. On this second missionary journey, we recognize that it's 10 years after the conversion experience of Paul on the road to Damascus. He has finished that first missionary journey. In in just round numbers, he got saved and filled with the Spirit about the year 35 A.D. And by the year 45 A.D., 10 years later, he's on his first missionary journey. And uh, give or take a few years, about 50 A.D., Paul is now on his second missionary journey. And what is he doing? He is going and telling the world. But here's the key. Here's the key. The key is not the Colosseum. The key is not the platform of the showmanship that we see today. The key is running one heart at a time, moving and preaching and teaching 
one heart at a time. When we read the stories in Acts 16, 17, and 18, Paul is going to cover Philippi, Thessalonica, Brea, Athens, and even Corinth. Now, these are cities, and entire cities are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and the preaching and the teaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But always recognize this, never overlook this. When people say, let's pray for the city, the transformation in the city can only happen within the heart of one person at a time. Now, we know that when Paul established the church in Philippi, later on, he's going to write a letter, and it's called the letter to the Philippians. And when he went to Thessalonica, he's going to write two letters in the Bible called First and Second Thessalonians. And when he went to Corinth, he's going to follow up with two letters, First and Second Corinthians. And when the end of the story of Acts chapter 18 happens, he's in Ephesus. And yes, he's going to write about spiritual warfare in a letter to the church in Ephesus. In our Bibles, we call it Ephesians. But recognize that the focus of the ministry of the Apostle Paul in each one of these cities, in all of these letters that is literally changing the world is a focused upon one heart at a time. And Paul receives this vision to go to Macedonia. Instantly, he and Silas board a ship, sail across the Aegean, and they land at Neapolis where they hike into Philippi. In Philippi, they meet a woman, and her name is Lydia. And define her character, define her position in the city. She is well, she is well recognized, very influential, very powerful. She's quite wealthy. She is a owner of a business, a merchant. The Bible calls her, and the enterprise is in the trading. In Philippi, of cloth that is purple. She's become quite wealthy, merchandising this trade of purple cloth. She is known so well that if you were to go to Philippi today, you would discover there is a river flowing on the outskirts of the city, and it is named the River of Lydia. She hears the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ from the apostle Paul. He is not intimidated by her social stat status or her wealth. He is not intimidated at all. She needs Jesus and he shares Christ with her one heart at a time. Lydia gives her heart to Christ filled with the Holy Spirit and all of her household gets gloriously saved. The Bible says they are baptized in water, one heart at a time. In Philippi, Paul is ministering every day, teaching in public places, teaching in the synagogue, or there where they gather for prayer. He is teaching and preaching. There's a young girl there. It's a slave girl, and the merchants have made money off of her being a fortune teller, for she was filled with a demon. One day Paul walked by and said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out. She was instantly delivered. And the Bible says that he was thrown into prison. He and Silas were thrown into prison. Here he is ministering one heart at a time, one life at a time, and the outcome is being arrested severely beaten and left in the dungeon, the darkest part of the prison in Philippi. It's midnight. He is worshiping the Lord with Silas. The Bible says that they are singing songs of him and glorious praise, and they are praying when all of a sudden God sends an eighth earthquake. The cell door flies open, and they are free. The jailer grabs his sword not to hurt Paul or Silas, 
but to end his own life because he knows if they escape, he will be executed. Paul says, don't do that. And one heart at a time, Jesus lives, leads this, the jailer to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible says that all of the household of the jailer is saved. That night, they're baptized in water. It's interesting to study the Bible. It's fascinating to realize that the focus is not upon the city, but it's on the heart of one person at a time. The first person is a woman. This person is a man. The first person has a name. The jailer's name, well, can I say it? He's nameless. She has gained much power and much wealth. As a jailer, he's so nameless that it's an indication he's living paycheck to paycheck. He's a working stiff. He's just trying to make a living to take care of his family. Nobody knows him, and he's certainly not powerful, and he has very little that he calls his own. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for the rich and the poor, the wealthy and the workers. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for the woman and the man. And Paul treats them with no favoritism. He's simply taking the gospel one heart at a time. He is ministering and he's teaching and he's leading people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lydia gets saved. The slave girl gets delivered. And the jailer, gloriously saved. Paul is moving from city to city. He's in Philippi. He makes his way down to Thessalonica. Here he is going to write some of the greatest works on eschatology, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he writes about the rapture of the church. He's writing to the people. Don't get confused with government and cities, states and nations, with people. First and second Thessalonians, he was writing to the people of Thessalonica. He was telling them that Christ will come like a thief in the night. He was telling them that the dead in Christ will rise and those that remain will be caught up in the air. They will be raptured. From Philippi, he goes to Thessalonica. And from Thessalonica, he's in Brea, where the people have such a hunger for the word of God, they're searching the scriptures every day. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Philippi, many people believe. The Bible says in the book of Thessal in Thessalonica, in the city of Thessalonica, excuse me, many people gave their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Brea, many people gave their hearts to Christ. He's going to go down to Athens. It is known for the philosopher and the scholar. To this day, Athens is known for men and names like Plato and Socrates. Well, he's in Athens. He's preaching and teaching. He comes across these scholars, these philosophers. He's in Athens. He's at the Acropolis, which is a mount above the city where there's built a, a temple called the pa par 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 Parthenon. And right outside the Parthenon, there's this, uh, from the temple, there's this mount called Mars Hill. And he, and he walks out to Mars Hill and he looks at all of these idols that they had. And one of them was inscribed with the name to the unknown God. And he begins to preach. He begins to preach that God made everything, that God's the creator of all things, that God is very, very much the author and the source of life and breath itself. And, and God wants us to seek him. God wants us to find him because he's very, very near. But we must turn from our ways and we must repent. And God the Father proved that Jesus is the Messiah because he raised him from the dead. Wherever Paul was, he wasn't preaching to a city 
He was preaching to the heart. He wasn't preaching to the head. He was preaching to the heart. He was preaching to the spirit of men. You remember the story of Nicodemus, the Pharisee, found in the gospel of John chapter 3. Jesus spoke to the man. And in John chapter 4, God was speaking to the woman at the well. Jesus was speaking to the woman. Jesus was speaking to the Pharisee. Paul was speaking to the wealthy lady named Lydia. God was speaking through Paul to the jailer and his family, one heart at a time. And whether they're rich, or whether a, they're just a jailer, or whether they're a great philosopher, the gospel message is never different. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was crucified on a cross, and he was risen on the third day. He is the Messiah. That's the message. And it's not delivered to the government. It's not delivered to the state. It's to delivered to the heart of every woman in the city, every man in the city, every worker in the city, every politician, every philosopher in the city. Paul will make his way down to Corinth, and by now, a young man that he had partnered with at the beginning of the trip in Lystria, Timothy, was helping up north in the ministry with Silas. Paul arrives in the city of Corinth by himself, solo. He meets Aquila and Priscilla. They're tent makers, although they're great teachers of the word of God. They befriend Paul and help him out in ministry. So now Paul is making tents in the daytime and preaching in the nighttime. He's overwhelmed. He's weary. He's distracted. It's a wonderful thing about the body of Christ and how God raises us up and we support one another. Paul would write about it later when we are the body of Christ and every part of the body has a purpose and God has a plan. The Bible says that things were going to change for Paul when Timothy and Silas arrived in the city of Corinth. You see, when these two brothers came, they enabled Paul to get back to the passion and the primary call upon his life. The Bible says that he could now work full time at preaching and teaching. That story kind of takes my breath away because it reminds me of Acts chapter 6 when Peter was struggling and John with the growth of the church and they were overwhelmed with everything going on. And they appointed deacons. So they could be focused upon prayer and study and the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. And you see, each and every one of us here today have a call of God. And the call of God is exactly the same. It is not to reach a group of people. It's to reach a person. And sometimes our, our visions and our goals are so enormous that we get overwhelmed and we do nothing. You have a friend. You have a member of your family. You have a neighbor. There's someone that you cross a path with. That's God's call upon your life. It's sharing the gospel, the good news, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, one heart at a time. But when we're distracted, when we're overwhelmed, we become redirected from God's call on our life. God put Timothy, God put Silas in the life of Paul that he might be able to complete the call of God upon his life. It's a beautiful story about the year and a half ministry of Paul in Corinth. Later, he's going to write these letters, First and Second Corinthians. He's going to write about spiritual maturity and carnal Christianity. He's going to write that, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding the work of the Lord, that you may know your labor is not in vain. 
He is going to write one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible about love called 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He writes the letter, 1 Corinthians, to the people in the city. It's not to the city, it's to the people in the city. He is writing to specific people. And if you'll carefully study the book of Philippians, the book of First and Second Thessalonians, and the book of First and Second Corinthians, and even later at the end of this trip, he goes to Ephesus and he writes them a letter called Ephesians, where he writes about spiritual warfare. Know with me in your study of every letter that Paul writes to churches that he had established, he summarizes the closing by naming names of friends in the ministry. You see, it's not about the platform. It's not about the Colosseum. It's, it's not about the great, great facilities. It's about Lydia. It's about Aquila and Priscilla. It's about Silas. It's about Timothy. It's about Apollos. It's about the jailer and his family. It's about the person and not the crowd, and not the city, and certainly not the platform. God moves in a great way in the city of Corinth, and we see many giving their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's unbelievable what God is able to accomplish when people are working together, when people are focused upon the heart, when people are focused upon the person where they are there ministering. To change the world, we must change the city. But to change the city, we must change the heart. And that is one heart at a time. We recognize in our study of Acts chapter 16, 17, and 18 that God will call and God will equip and God will empower us to be focused upon one heart at a time. In the late 1800s in England, a young woman by the name of Mary Brown listened from the pew as her pastor preached on reaching the world one heart at a time. He was preaching about reaching the lost. He was preaching about changing one heart at a time. He was preaching on world missions with a focus upon reaching one heart at a time. She was so impacted by his preaching, she picked up a pen and she began to write, I will go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll go over the mountain or the plain or the sea. I'll go where you want me to go. I will say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. This song has been sung for a hundred years. I will go where you want me to go. Thousands of young adults, men and women, have said yes to the call of God. Today, there are missionaries in Africa. Today, there's missionaries in China and Russia, the Philippines and Japan, Brazil and Argentina. There are missionaries around the world that have sung the song, walked to an altar and said, yes, Lord, I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. For God will call me, and God will equip me, and God will empower me, and I will be focused on reaching one heart, one soul, one spirit, one person at a time. Oh, yes, Lord, I will go where you want me to go. Oh, yes, Lord, I will say what you want me to say to Lydia, to the jailer, to Timothy, to Aquila and Priscilla, reaching one heart at a time.